Hi, it's Steve Hargadon and welcome to this mini conference, AI and Libraries, Applications, Implications and Possibilities. This is the opening keynote. We're delighted to have you here. Special thanks to the founding partner of this long running conference series, San Jose State University School of Information. We're now gonna turn a little bit of time over to Dr. Sandra Hirsch and Dr. Anthony Chow from San Jose State. Well, hi everyone, I'm Sandy Hirsch. I am the Associate Dean for Academics in the College of Professional and Global Education at San Jose State University. And on behalf of San Jose State University, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this Library 2.0 conference, AI and Libraries Applications, Implications and Possibilities. We've all seen AI in the headlines, uh, particularly generative AI, such as chat GPT. And as we've seen, it's raising a lot of really um, intriguing questions about how it's going to impact the way we live, how we work, how we learn. And today's mini conference will focus specifically on how AI, um, what, uh, on, on AI and what that means for libraries in particular. We are especially thrilled at the amount of interest that this topic is generated. And we have received more proposals for this particular mini conference than we have for any prior mini conference. And unfortunately we couldn't accommodate them all today, but um, we've arranged for April 18th to continue to showcase some of the remaining outstanding proposals that we received so we can continue the conversation about AI in the future. Um, I especially want to thank today's partner uh, for our mini conference, Dr. Raymond Pun. He is the academic and research librarian at Alder Graduate School of Education, and he has wears many hats, including he's the immediate past president of the Chinese American Librarians Association and a past president of the Asian Pacific American Libraries, Librarians Association. And he's also a current candidate running for ALA president. In addition to being a very active leader in our field, I've seen him everywhere. He's also been thinking extremely deeply about how um, AI um, is and um, what the implications are for libraries. And he's been speaking about this topic quite a bit as well. So we were very thrilled when he agreed to work with us to assemble this mini conference, particularly given his extremely hectic schedule. San Jose State University iSchool is proud to sponsor this important discussion, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about AI and its implications and possibilities for libraries. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Anthony Chow, who is the director of the San Jose State University School of Information. Thank you, Sandy. Um, first of all, uh, my apologies. I'm a bit under the weather, so I'm going to uh, have my camera off, but uh, I'm Anthony Chow, the director of the School of Information. We are so thrilled to sponsor today's mini conference on AI and libraries. Uh, special thanks to Sandy, Ray, Steve, and Library 2.0, and all of our presenters who have uh, dedicated and committed their time to be with us today. We view AI as both friend and foe and are excited about its potential, but also remain guarded about some of the cons and the expected technical and intellectual challenges that we know are going to occur. Anyway, with that being said, have a wonderful conference and an even better day. Steve? Thank you, Dr. Chow and Dr. Hirsch. Uh, Ray, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Dr. Sandy Hirsch and Dr. Anthony Chow and San Jose State University, the iSchool, and so many different partners and supporters here today. We have already hit over a thousand people attendees right now, and so, it was wonderful just seeing where folks are coming from all over the world and just to have this conversation and, and hear what our stellar panelists will be talking about. I am delighted to welcome our esteemed panelists uh, and I'll briefly introduce them and then we'll get into our conversations focusing on AI and libraries and the implications and considerations in terms of applications, possibilities and ethical thoughts. So we'll start with um, Ida Mae Craddock who is a uh, school librarian at the Albert Marley County Public Schools Community Lab Schools in Virginia. And then next we have Dr. Brandy McNeil, who is the Deputy Director of Programs and Services at the New York Public Library. And then we have Dr. Leo Lowe, who is the Dean and Professor of the College of University Libraries and Learning Sciences at the University of New Mexico. 
welcome Dr. McNeil, Dr. Lowe, and Ida May. Really delighted to have you all here. And so first, we wanted to start off with this important question, which is looking at AI in the types of libraries you work in. If you can tell us how you've been seeing AI being used in your libraries or the type of libraries you work in, school, public, academic, et cetera, feel free to share that. And we'll start off with Dr. McNeil. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna say thank you to Library 2.0, the San Jose State School of Information for hosting this event and also you, Ray. Um, thank you for having me. So public libraries have and will continue to play a major role in information literacy uh, and digital equity. And so we are using AI internally to increase the performance, speed and accuracy of our internal processes, external processes and services. So some of the ways in which we are using AI in public libraries are for FAQ creation, emails, uh, helping with customer complaints, uh, outlines for curriculum. We're also using it in, in a variety of different ways to create schedules. And when you think of some of the internal ways that we're using it, we're looking at cataloging books, providing information literacy classes such as AI basics or one-on-one -on -one classes. So people can really understand what AI is good at, what it's not good at. We're also doing a lot of um, what we consider kind of helping us to ensure that data is recorded accurately. So I know San Jose Public Library uses AI to help with accuracy and data recording of people coming into uh, their library systems. But at the New York Public Library specifically, one of the things that we have done is to create an AI committee. And so we modeled it to be similar to the Library of Congress's phases of AI, where we're understanding, experimenting, and then implementing. And so we created a cross-departmental working group, and we broke that into subgroups. And those subgroups have been evaluating existing AI-related activities. We've also engaged in conversations by having experts come in and hosting symposia. And then we've also been looking at and experimenting with AI. And some of the ways we've done that is with Whisper AI in terms of our research division. We've also been playing with coding with the Devon software. I don't know if everybody knows about that one. Devon is the Cognition's um, first AI software engineer. So we've been playing with that, looking at creating our own data sets, such as the one that NA Birds created. Um, that's very time consuming. I wanna let you all know. Um, we've also been experimenting um, and having talks with uh, the Library of Congress about their experiments. So there's quite a few things that public libraries have been doing um, in, in the realm of AI. Great, thank you for sharing that. It's really exciting to see and hear what you've been seeing and what uh, New York Public Library is doing and what, what you've been involved with. Uh, how about we go with Ida May and then Leo? Thank you so much for having me. Um, I have been seeing it a lot, which for school libraries, we're usually the first to encounter a technology in our schools. It usually arrives into the library and then we learn it and then pass it on to our teachers. So we have been using it for, um, I'm gonna say like two or three years and I'm seeing um, things that we would expect AI to be used for like generating essays, um, but also things that we don't expect like leveling text translation, which is a critical use in schools and in school libraries, making sure that kids have access to the curriculum by leveling and translating text so that they can access that information. Um, we are also using it to create custom materials so that we can address directly what is happening in that particular class and it's not gonna take us four hours to make those products. So using that to manipulate text, absolutely. We're also using it to do things like the teachers do, like create groups, process data, do scheduling, things like that. So it has been a boon to school libraries for sure in the past year or so. Um, so it's very similar in the academic library environment. And first of all, thank you for having me here. And it's really great to see so many people from so many different parts of the world being here. Uh, and I saw some familiar faces, so hello to you all. Um, so for 
academic libraries, I'll focus on generative AI because AI is very broad and we have been using AI in very different uh, uh, environments or different ways. But generative AI, I think that's what people are really talking about. And we it's quite new that we want to um, experiment with um, um, right now. And we are experimenting. So last summer, we set up a um, what we call GPT-4 exploration program that we paid for the premium version of ChatGPT for a cohort of 10 people across different units um, in our college with very different level of AI skills, you know, and then to use, try to explore GPT-4 for their work. Uh, it was structured in a way that we learned together. We got together every other week to discuss and to share tips, lessons learned, challenges, basically a structured um, community of practice. And here are some of the examples, and we may pursue some of these things further if they you know, end up working well. One of our staff in the university press experimented with generating alt text for images, drafting correspondence, editing bibliographies, and creating promotional copy. We have somebody, a, a director in the research uh, data uh, research data services to develop a machine readable data management plan. We have uh, another staff um, working on facilitate, facilitating staff patron interaction with AI, focusing on using it to create templates, uh, using FAQs, um, and then kind of compare to see the human created FAQ versus the machine created FAQs. Uh, we have Another staff person in technical services using it for cataloging and metadata management, trying it out to see whether they, that can provide some solutions for some common issues. Um, the, also, in, instruction librarians using it to develop lesson plans. But the person that was the most excited was my assistant. She saved so much time using AI to help her do calendaring, booking flights, uh, emailing, and all of that. So I would say that one of the easiest way to use it is for some of these administrative tasks and it's quite easy to implement. Of course, you still have to be careful not to, first of all, proofread and then not upload anything too sensitive until we know a little bit more. So we're hoping to expand this kind of cohort system to the rest of the university. And we're trying to work partnering with our Center for Teaching and Learning and kind of get other faculty outside the libraries to participate in having our, the librarians taking the lead on this. So we're still brainstorming and kind of experimenting at this point. Well, that's really great, all of you, what you shared. And we're seeing an active chat right now with people sharing from what they're doing and what they're um, working on in their different institutions or in their communities. And so it's a really a great opportunity to, for us to come together right now to, 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 to hear each other and learn what's going on in the library profession. And it's important to note that these tools have always seem to be um, around in terms of AI, right? The, 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 as, a, as a scientific discipline, it's been around since the 50s. And now a lot of um, folks are looking into it more closely in these different areas and functions that we're seeing day to day because of the convenience or the accessibility or the abundance of these different tools. And so it's becoming more um, pronounced in what we're doing day to day as, as all of you alluded to. And so, um, as Leo also pointed out, that there are some concerns that we'll definitely get into certainly right after. And uh, we'll definitely want to hear um, from each of you uh, thinking about the tools. Um, so uh, Dr. McNeil, you mentioned Dev Devon, and, and there are so many tools that people are sharing in the chat box. So I want to ask all of you if there's a, a tool that you're seeing most people are using, but particularly in your constituents, maybe as teachers or students, uh, general public or researchers or faculty. So maybe we'll start off with item A. Sure. So um, there's piles of tools for teachers. And um, I do want to note that school libraries are very much constrained in what they can use and what they can't used by our um, school boards. So the things that we are using a lot are tools that are available to the adults in the building because we're waiting on policy to come forward. So uh, we're not seeing the students use it in elementary and up through middle. It's not being used in the classrooms. In high school, that's changing. So we're getting some more use in classrooms from the high school people. 
Um, and I think the tools that you want are going to be based on where you are in the technology integration matrix. So if you are just at the entry level, ChatGPT is amazing. Its um, data set foundation is Reddit which makes it an incredibly great at natural language processing. So it can be extremely useful as an entry point for um, any AI. I also might put in the entry phase, the big image editor, because that is also um, something that's extremely easy to use. Um, for the adoption people, Diffit is a great tool. It levels text and will generate um, different kinds of questions. And if you're in a public school with a testing culture, having those practice questions is very nice and easy. We're also seeing a lot of the Google Immersive Translate being used because we do have students of other languages who need to access the curriculum. And then Rask AI also is a great one for um, translation. If you're in adoption, adoption then they're really using the traditional AI tools like ChatGPT to do other things and using them in non-traditional ways like editing. So kids will put in their paper and get editing back from the AI, which is a great use of it. We're also using it to generate research topics. There's lots of times where students will be in the library and be a little bit like frozen with possibility and just like um, decision panic and using an AI generator to work through that phase of doing research has been really helpful. Um, in Infusion, OpenAI, um, the Codex is very helpful, and also Tab9, because we can use that AI to make our own products. So when we're using it to um, process data that's specific to our school or specific to our division, then training and creating our own AI engines is really important. There's also the denial group. We can't forget about that. <laughs> They're just like, I'm not doing it. Um, and I feel like that's okay. This is gonna be one of those technologies where right now it seems really scary. And as we get into it and start using it in good and interesting ways, um, that's going to fade. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. The policy aspect, I would love to hear um, more later uh, that we can discuss. I'll pass it over to Leo and then Dr. McNeil. So I think, yeah, most people are probably still using ChatGPT, the free version, um, or Bing, because that they let you have access to GPT-4 for free. Um, and, and echoing, uh, I don't know, depending on where you are, I, th I see some pe people who are a little bit more, quote unquote, advanced, I see them using Claude from Anthropic. Claude 3 is pretty amazing. And Gemini for Google is another one. Um, I know quite a few universities are trying other kind of more research-oriented models like Site.ai or Kineas. Um, and the publishers are also developing their own. Um, Elsevier has developed Scopus AI and they're working on Science Direct. So you can still, I think we will see a lot more of these niche ones coming out. I have been trying perplexity a lot um, lately. Uh, there are a lot of talks about perplexity being the quote, the Google killer, um, which is worth thinking about for us as librarians, because generative AI is really changing information discovery. We have been using that Google style search for at least two decades now. We put in a keyword or a prompt or questions, and then we get a list of links and then apply, hopefully, information literacy or critical thinking skills to kind of evaluate, review, and then pick out the, the, the information that we need. But with Gen AI, the information discovery process will be, you put in a prompt or question, you get an answer. And then at this point, we're not quite sure how the AI selects that those answers or whether they are the best answers. So there are a lot of potentials in using generative AI for information discovery, like time savings or personalized responses. But as librarians, I think we should be very aware of and be knowledgeable about their limitations as well as they progress. And I'm sure they'll improve. Um, so that's something I would definitely, you know, ask people to think more about. Um, and I want to get back to the chat GPT versus GPT-4. I've done the AI literacy survey, a large scale one last year, and I found that only about six, 
less than 7% of people pay for any kind of AI tools. And there's a correlation association with people who use the paid version have higher literacy or skills level than people who don't, which makes sense. They just probably use it more. So that's something we may want to think about in library land. We may want to provide those kind of opportunities for people to have access to these premium versions. Otherwise, there are potentials for widening and narrowing the digital divide. We want to narrow it and not widen it even more. So, yeah. I completely agree with you, Leo. Um, digital equity is so important to public libraries. Uh, what I see that we've been using, um, obviously ChatGPT, uh, but I have seen an increase in the paid format only because of some of the features that you actually get. People want to be able to use it for data analyzation. And so that's where I'm starting to see an uptick in people looking towards the paid version. Um, Perplexity AI is another one that people, I think within our industry, they really like it because of the anonymous feature of it. Uh, we're also seeing Canva Magic Studio being used to help with creating a lot of the flyers um, for programming. Um, and so that's been really interesting. Obviously we know that we have people using Mid Journey and Stable Fusion. I think what's, what's unique within our system is that, you know, we, we provide to every age group, um, and every type of person, whether they're in school, not in school. And so we are seeing a difference in what people are using in their schools versus what they want to use on their free time. Um, and so depending on the system, right, the library system itself, and what is firewalled and what isn't or what's barred and what's not, uh, we have seen pe more people using uh, Microsoft Copilot. Um, some people are blocked from using uh, Google Gemini. Uh, so we're seeing that. I would also say on the back end, we are seeing an uptick in usage of Zoom AI Companion and Google's uh, Duet AI note taker features. That has been uh, huge. However, I will say that it's great that it provides the, the summary and the notes. Um, one thing is that you do have to go in and, and kind of massage that information that's there. Um, just to make it understandable quite a lot. Uh, some other ones that I will say that I've seen is, um, you know, being able to use it for translating in multiple languages is, is one of the key reasons why a lot of people like to use things, especially like Otter AI. Um, other tools I would like to just kind of mention, when we are trying to teach someone just a little bit about what large language models do or how do you train um, the tool, we'll use Quick Draw by Google just to kind of show a little bit of that. Goblin Tools has been something that people have found really interesting and different, um, as well as you mentioned Claude, Andy Search. I would say Adobe Firefly is a new one uh, and the image generation that we're start, starting to see an uptick. And then we're also noticing a lot of um, teams who are using character.ai. Uh, which is a tool that really will allow them to kind of take on different characters to kind of come up with the responses. Um, and they actually have a library and Linda tool in that. So um, something really interesting. And Futurepedia is one where a lot of people are going just to see what are the types of AI tools that are out there. And lastly, I know Girls Who Code had actually worked with uh, Girl Jams. And so that's another tool where we see libraries kind of showing that tool to kind of help more girls to get into the idea of AI. Because one of the main things that we want to also ensure is that there are more women in AI as well. Thank you all for sharing. It is resonating with a lot of the attendees here who are sharing a lot of different tools that they're using and seeing. So, so please keep, keep sharing the information. And so it brings me to some of the points that all of you mentioned, which includes this um, digital inequity that's being perpetuated potentially, right? If you have access to the tool, but then also if you know how to use the tool, you might have access, right? As a premium subscriber, but if you don't know how to use it, it's kind of like a, a challenge in itself. And so we're seeing this uh, concept of information privilege being played out where if you have access based on your affordance or institutional affiliation, then you will have an advantage, right? And how do we close that gap, right? In addition to the broadband issues, the, the computer skills, the, the access in terms of the technology itself, the, the, the hardware, software, and then also like 
these specific AI literacy or AI um, uh, technological sort of interests and skills coming in. And, and so there's that fundamental piece that that will in, get people excited, but also we need to also see this uh, this inequity that that is inherent it, that's happening. And then the other point that came out was policies. I thought that was really interesting, um, Ida May. I work with teachers, teacher educators, and all these different partners we have, at least just informally asking like where, where they are located in terms of the policy in using these tools. It seems like it's not clear. And so that's something that I'm seeing in higher ed too, where some schools are really clear with what they're encouraging people to use or to explore or not to use. Like we saw, for instance, that the New York uh, City um, schools, they initially banned it and then they flipped it, right? Like like almost <laughs> like 180 um, within a month because of the concerns that they might have with students not using their uh, critical thinking skills and so forth because of these tools. So there's these policies that are happening where it's 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 not going to be clear. And I know there's a lot of discussions with in, in the government, in the United States, in terms of regulatory practices, and, and that might have implications. And of course, in the states, in the states, there are privacy laws coming up where it's about making sure your data as a consumer is protected and these commercial tools might be um, collecting some data, right? It's, it's inevitable. So, so there's gonna be some, some friction that we're seeing now. And so those are some points I wanted to highlight. In addition, there is this interesting tool that came out not too long ago. It's still, I think, under OpenAI called Sora, making these videos. Have, have some of you used it? Yeah. Uh, Dr. McNeil, did you wanna say something about that? Yes, Sora is um, <laughs> one of my biggest fears. It is one of my biggest fears. Um, it's a great tool. I've seen it. It it's really amazing. There there's this one um kind of video that they've made this kind of text to to video generation of these golden retrievers playing and they look absolutely real. It looks like a place in Colorado, somebody's backyard with all the snow. Um but I I think what worries me truly is the fact that you know, right now, sometimes you, you're you able to tell when it's a, it's a fake, right? Maybe there's an extra hand, extra finger, a head, an eye, something that kind of alerts you to that. And I think what's happening now is we might not be able to tell that. And if we can't, I think that's going to cause um, some issues. And and that's what makes me nervous with, with Sora. So we'll see what happens they they haven't fully released it um one thing to note about sora is that they did um say that they are working with educators and policymakers they have a red team that's going through and really trying to make sure that um you know that, that they really do access, extensive research and testing but they also stated that they can't predict all of the beneficial ways that the technology will be used nor the ways it will be abused. And that to me is really key because I think that's the worry. When we are not able to fully figure out whether it is real or not, we're gonna be in trouble. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I wanted to, before we move on to the next question, wanted to see if Ida May or Leo, if you have any reactions or responses to what was just shared. I would say absolutely. I think that there is, in school libraries in particular, um, student data is private. And in the United States, it's controlled by a law called FERPA, where we cannot give any student data at all unless they have an educational interest in that child. So they have to have some kind of reason for wanting that data. So we cannot put any student data at all into any of these generative generative AIs. So not images, not um, names, not ages, not any of that. So using it for things like making reports requires things like anonymizing the data and making sure that we're pulling data that is not attached to student names and numbers and things like that. I also wanted to note that we are talking about bias and particularly the digital divide there's also some very cool ways that AI is bridging that divide. In schools, we are using it to make curriculum accessible and to remove the barrier of 
language from the knowledge that is required in that class. So it's not perfect. There's absolutely problems with bias. One of the things I always want to do is encourage librarians and women and people of color to use AI as much as possible because we are contributing to the data set. And the more we are using it and correcting it, because you can say things like, thanks ChatGPT, but I need this lesson to be more culturally responsive. So the more we are correcting and calling out to the AI when it is displaying bias, then I think we can improve it. Is it gonna ever be perfect? Probably not. It will always hallucinate. It will always give you exactly what you want or what you told it you wanted. Um, but I think that there are things that we can do to work towards a better future with that. Yeah, I just want to echo that. I, despite all the flaws and limitations, and hopefully they will improve, but they may never get perfect. The internet is not perfect. We still use it. Hopefully, use it well. Um, but I do. I'm very optimistic about the really amazing potential of generative AI in education, in teaching and learning. I will share a quick, very quick story, like thirty seconds. When I was like eight, nine years old, I was terrible in chemistry because of one instance. I in the class, the teacher was showing chemical reactions in the class jar in front of you know at the at the table at, at the desk, and all the kids are surrounding it. And I asked the question, "How come the glass did not react?" And the teacher just said, "Because it's glass." And all the kids laughed and everything. And I was like very really embarrassed and all of that. So I never found out about why glass didn't react because I was terrible. I hated chemistry. And then just a few months ago, I asked ChatGPT, explain it to me why that is. And they explained to me because now I'm I'm an adult, I can understand it. And then I asked it to explain, explain it to me like a 10 year old. And it did using a spider web and analogy and all of that. And I was like, I wish I had that when I was a kid. Imagine that kind of power that can just personalize learning for every kid. So I do see the potential, although we do have to work on the, the limitations. Yeah, thank you both for sharing your thoughts on that. And it certainly resonates with a book that I had just uh, finished reading by um, Dr. Fei-Fei Li from Stanford University, who is a renowned computer engineer and expert in artificial intelligence tools. And in, in her book that just came out maybe late last year, The Worlds I See, she acknowledges the problems, the ethical concerns that we were talking about, privacy, surveillance, the biases, but also like to your point, Ida May, she acknowledges that the future may be uncertain, but the field will continue to be being more diverse, more inclusive, more open to expertise from other disciplines, which may help reflect that for a better society in these tools. Like Leo pointed out, the internet is not great. The search engines aren't great, like some people pointing out in the chat box. So it's it's going to take some time um, and it's a process, right? It's going to be ongoing. And so that is um, something I wanted to share. And moving on to some of the other concerns. So we're seeing a lot of lawsuits coming up. Uh, against some of these companies, thinking about AI and the copyright infringement. We're looking at basically um, these lawsuits being filed against these companies because of this infringement where also media companies like the New York Times, Getty Images have filed lawsuits. And I think um, it's it's important to recognize that we all work you know, with credible published sources and we share that information and so forth. And so I, I was wondering um, from your perspective, Point of view, your thoughts about AI and and these issues with um, copyright infringement, or just broadly thinking about the impact on our behaviors. If if you wanna to also um, talk about that, so we'll start off with Leo. So disclaimer: I'm not a legal expert, but based on conversations with people who have that kind of expertise, and so there are valid concerns on both sides when it comes to the impact of AI, especially generative AI models on copyright and the livelihoods of creators. So on one hand, training AI models on copyrighted works is likely a fair use when done for nonprofit research and educational purposes. So that's based on legal precedent around text and data mining. So and restricting AI training to only public domain or licensed work could limit the scope of AI enabled research. 
and could lead to biases um, of what can be studied. Now, on the other hand, content creators and copyright holders have understandable fears that AI outputs could potentially infringe on their works or undermine the market for them, especially if an AI model ends up memorizing or reproducing substantial portions of their creations, kind of like what the end, uh, New York Times lawsuit was really about. But the mechanics of how these models work make it really difficult to predict or even pre prevent such infringement ahead of time. So there's some thoughts on we probably need a balanced approach that allows AI training for scholarly research to continue under fair use while implementing reasonable regulations and best practices to protect privacy, ethics, and the valid interests of these copyright holders. And um, some solutions or possible solutions have been proposed. Uh, one say AI platforms should avoid training on duplicates of the same work to reduce memorization risk. Uh, AI training should incorporate human feedback to help filter out private sensitive content. Um, disclosure of training data sources should be required. Um, right holders should have the ability to opt out of commercial AI training of their works, um, and but not maybe not AI training for non-profit for research because that could be fair use. Um, also, development of standardized licensing terms for research uses of AI that you know would address security or, or distribution of original content. Um, so these are some of the possible solutions. I, right now, I think all the rules are still being set. It'll be nice, it'll be good for us to be uh, at least somewhat knowledgeable about this topic so that we can kind of give our voice to say what are some of the things that people really should think about. I mean, what I just lit is just a few of these things. I think we can you know, look at it from very different perspectives and give the lawmakers and other people, the regulators, you know, something to really think about. Thanks for uh, highlighting that, Leo. Um, Dr. McNeil? I agree with everything Leo said. Um, I'm going to skip some of the stuff he said um, and maybe point out a couple of other things um, in relation to what you mentioned, too, about kind of some behaviors. I, I too, am you know, paying close attention to the, the New York Times lawsuit to see how that's going to come out. Um, however, I think about copyright, the copyright situation, and I think about, you know, what happened with the advent of the camera, right? And so that created a copyright issue regarding who's taking the picture, the camera or the person. And this kind of reminds me of, of similarly what we're going through right now. And I think when you look at cases such as, um, author Paul Tremblay and Sarah, Sarah Silverman, they have um, a case where they're claiming that, you know, the AI software had unlawfully scraped their work. And so the judge partially dismissed the case on the ground that the authors had not shown that their work was substantial in, in similarity. So for me, I think that's the key right there, right? The copyright law says, it has to sufficiently cre be creative, sorry, has to be sufficiently creative and done by a human. And I think that's where we start to see this gray area in our laws and policies. And so we're gonna have a challenge with trying to figure out um, how that's gonna work. Um, there was also, and I don't wanna butcher her name, but there was a young lady who had actually gotten a license after she created um, some AI generated work, um, she got uh, it copyrighted and they actually ended up revoking that um, later. So I know she's actually going to be submitting um, some more work soon. So be on the lookout for that. But I think one of the things that I think we'll start to see as people start to explore more with this will be about their own information. What do they want to share? What don't they want to share? What are they going to be concerned about? If you look at um, the the partnership with Reddit and Google, okay, what does that mean? What is being shared? Are people going to be worried about what's being put out or what they might have shared within Reddit? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I also think that one of the key factors in this is that we're talking about 
enormous sizes of data sets. And so when you think about that, it is really hard for someone to go back and say, because you're not able to even look at all of these data sets and say, this is actually, here's my work that you took and copied here. So I think that poses uh, a huge problem when you look at the Actors Guild and the reason why they really wanna make sure that their likeness and voice and face aren't used with AI, especially you know changing people's mindsets of when they see something that says in perpetuity. I think that will start to change things up a bit as well. And I really feel like one of the things that we're gonna have to do um, is to look at copyright um, collectives, right? a group of people are gonna to have to come together to negotiate copyright compensation. And it has to be done at the international level because the data sets are done at an international level. So I think those are some of the behaviors that will hopefully start to see change as um, as we go. And hopefully, you know, responsible AI, explainable AI will, will help to make things better. I feel like copyright is one of those topics where when you bring it up in a group of librarians, everybody's like, yes, let's talk about copyright. <laughs> Yay! Um, it is deeply affecting us in a variety of ways in the schools. It is absolutely changing the way that we talk about academic integrity and um, what it means to have your own idea and intellectual property. The Thaler versus Perlmutter um, case that is currently going through the federal courts is very interesting as far as copyright goes because they are not granting copyright as Dr. McNeil was talking about on the product like you can't whatever the AI spits out is can't get a copyright but the prompt can which is really going to change how we're talking to our students about the prompt engineering search terms what words are they typing into the engine and how, and what that means for who owns that product. So using it to like reverse engineering where you're asking it to edit or generate ideas. Okay, but you know, turning in the thing that was spit out, that's not okay because it is the product of the work of billions of people and billions of prompts. It is not your product and understanding like how data sets work and how that's not yours is important to talk to kids about. Can I add one thing? That's something that we actually just experienced, you know, in, in the library setting where if you're doing, say, a contest where you're having people create digital art and you don't know that this person used, you know, AI generated images to help create that work, is it is it fair? Is it not fair? What policies do you now need in place for the the contest and different programs that you're doing to make sure that this doesn't happen and that something more doesn't happen. So um, yeah, I fully agree with that. I have this interesting question in the chat that I really do want to talk about. Um, where, like, how do you cite a product from an, an AI engine? So when you go into the terms of service, it assigns the copyright to the prompt engineer. When you are citing it, it says, you don't need to cite me. I have actually just directly asked the engine, how do you, how are you cited? Um, and it says that a citation is not required. I disagree. So when I am citing it, I'm actually using the prompt engineer as the author, and then the prompt as the title, and then of course the date. Um, that's easy because we're in APA. It gets a little trickier when you're doing things like Chicago. So um, citations is also one of those subjects where I'm like, yes, I would like to talk about citations. Thank you so much for letting me do that. I'd like to, yeah, add to that too is, you know, because we work with all uh, faculty who have to submit the articles to journals and they all have very, have very different policies now, but they all say a, uh, AI cannot be an author. So then it comes to the question, whose work is that then? If you just ask AI, right, is, is this still your work because you prompted it? Or So that's not that's still unclear. And some publishers just flat out say, no AI generated content can be submitted. But my question is, how are they going to know? 
So some of these things are just there and I think it's still evolving. Um, so um, very, very curious to see how this kind of, you know, move forward. Right, totally. And in terms of going back to like this whole question of policy to encapsulate some of these issues, I, I, it's going to be changing all the time. Like what we're discussing now, I bet it will probably look very different next year, right? Or even six months from now because of some of the implications we're seeing, whether they're lawsuits or some other issues happening in terms of how people are strategizing to, to be consistent with the policies. I know in the chat box, people had also mentioned some other issues that came up, which included environmental concerns because um, Dr. McNeil, you mentioned these are large data sets right, that need to be in servers, right? And, and what kind of environmental hazard or impact does it have having these huge data sets um, that need to be stored, creating um, carbon issues and so forth. And then there's the labor practice too, right? Because we assume that they're all generated, but there's often a content moderator or someone looking at it and making sure it's you know connected. And, and I think there's a lawsuit happening or will be filed, I believe, um, from some workers in Kenya who've been doing this work. And so uh, because of the underpaid practices and so forth. So we're seeing like all these sort of implications that are environmental and international coming in. And so I, I, th I just wanted to um, uh, call them out since people had mentioned them in the chat box. And uh, we'll proceed to our um, next question, which is looking at the resources. So you shared earlier about the different types of tools you've been looking at and you've been using or seeing your, your communities using. And there's just a flow a flooding really of information. Like how do you stay on top of it? Like what is your, what are your go-to resources to stay on top of it? Not necessarily the AI tools themselves, but like how you stay up to date with all this um, information coming in. And so what resources would you recommend to attendees who are here if they wanted to explore more about AI in school, academic or public libraries? And we'll start off with uh, Dr. McNeil. Thank you. Well, first, I mean, attend programs like this, <laughs> conferences like this, this is, such an amazing one because I looked at some of the other sessions you're going to have and there there's so many that are so awesome that I think a lot of people will benefit from. Um, I would also say I would also think that the Public Library Association, they're doing uh, a conference in like two weeks in Columbus, Ohio. So there will be discussions um, around AI and workshops as well as the uh, American Library Association also um, having their conference in June, and they will uh, also have workshops where they're speaking about AI. I know I will actually do be doing um, an AI session at both of those events. Um, but I would also say part of how I kind of stay up to date is through a variety of things. So one, I would say, really, if you're not following a lot of the tech um, blogs or magazines or however, whatever medium you like to do, um, you need to Verge, Mashable, Wired, CNET, um, you know, MIT Technology Review. I also think you should look at your local platforms. So there's one in New York City called Tech NYC. And what I love about them is that they don't just tell you about the latest in tech, but they also tell you about the funding opportunity opportunities, the latest pitch competitions, um, you know, when Robinhood uh, released that they're doing an AI poverty challenge with the Bezos Family Foundation and GitLab Foundation, um, they put that in there. The Library Journal is another one. They just did an AI adoption and library series that I think is extremely useful for people, especially if you're trying to get your feet wet with AI. Um, follow reports like the Pew Research Center and the Center for Urban Feature. I think you need to be following movers and shakers in the industry as well. So if you're not doing that, start following, you know, Meredith Broussard, uh, Joy uh, Bulamwini, Nick Tanzi, uh, Abram Maldonado is another one. Follow those people. I think lastly, I would say, you know, just stay reading. Read the Department of Education's Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Learning Report. Um, check out the Library of Congress blog called The Signal. Um, that will keep you informed on all things digital within um, the Library of Congress. And uh, I'll let everybody else suggest a couple more. Thank you, Ida May and then Leo. I think because we want to double down on reliable sources of information for the school librarians in the audience, I'm gonna recommend School Library Journal and Knowledge Quest. School Library Journal in particular 
has been prolific in speaking about this topic. So there are a lot of articles in School Library Journal about this. Um, I think the other thing that I would recommend is small, those very small virtual talks that are given by practitioners. So people who are librarians and how they are using AI has been great for me because it definitely talks about ideas and usage and less about how to do things, which is great. So for me, the short answer is I cannot keep up, just it's too much stuff. Um, but here are some of the things I feel that may be very, may be useful. One is if we want something that's library related, Choice 360 is a good, um, I'll put the links in the in the chat, by the way, after I finish this. Um, they have con they have a series of webinars now and even podcasts that you can listen to that are very library related and a lot of AI related stuff. Um, Perplexity started a new podcast. So you may want to check that out. It's mostly about uh, generative AI. Um, New York Times has a has a podcast called Hard Fork, which is also very, very good and very uh, entertaining as well. So you may want to check that out. Uh, for more education related at search, they have a podcast series. I've done one with them. I'll put it in the link uh, as well. So you can take a look at that. And um, I read a book called Prediction Machines. It's just a very, it came out a few years ago by several business school professors, but it's really good. They looked at um, AI from an economics, uh, e economist kind of perspective, which was very interesting. And I get a lot of my news on LinkedIn, actually. So if you're on LinkedIn, go there. You can follow me. Um, you can, I mean, a lot of people post up on there. So follow follow the, the thought leaders, like, you know, others have said. Um, I have published a few articles uh, on AI literacy and also a prompting framework that is more on critical thinking rather than, you know, prompt tips. So you may want to check that out. Um, and because I'm an ACRL vice president now, I join ACRL, you get some, you know, uh, uh, good information there. So I'll put some of these links in the chat so you can click on them as you kind of listen through. Great, thank you all so much. Yeah, we'll try to save the chat to share back out to everyone who's joining us today. And I also wanted to um, give a few highlights. I um, wanna give a shout out to Nicole Hennig, who's in the call um, from University of Arizona. Uh, Nicole has an incredible newsletter. I've been following for over, I think 10 years, looking at um, user experience. And now there's an AI evaluation. Uh, page. And so uh, check out Nicole's um, information. The other person I really uh, admire and the work she's been doing for quite some time on this topic is Dr. Safia Noble, who is the Internet Studies Scholar and Professor of Gender Studies and African American Studies at UCLA, and has been looking into the issues of data, search engines, technological issues, and privacy. So be sure to check out um, Dr. Noble's work. And Leo mentioned about LinkedIn. And so I, I particularly go to LinkedIn um, from time to time because of this one individual who is the CEO of The Atlantic, uh, Nicholas Thompson, who used to be at Wire, as uh, Dr. McNeil mentioned, The Wire magazine. And um, he does this um, every now, it used to be every day, but now it's like every other day, the most interesting thing in tech. And he breaks it down in like two minutes about whether it's a court case, some sort of tool, some sort of moment in AI or any technology, right? Um, that intersects with society. So it's really, really interesting. And he posts them on uh, LinkedIn. So feel free to check that out. Um, we're about um, a few more minutes before closing. So we thought maybe we can try to squeeze this last question in. It looks like we can do that. Okay. So it's a last question on any words or thoughts about AI and libraries and specifically, how do you anticipate libraries and library workers and the workforce overall being impacted by these tools? And I know we could talk about it for hours, but maybe we could just um, share some nuggets here and there. So we'll start with Ida May. So I don't anticipate that um, the librarian profession will be subsumed by AI. There is, uh, particularly school librarians, aren't really replaceable by AI as it currently exists. We do do a lot of, like our whole mission is to encourage a love of reading and that is our focus. However, every school librarian knows that that's one of your jobs and you probably have 16 other jobs that you are also doing. And doing things like 
teaching kids about critical thinking, relationship management, the design process, collaboration, leadership, all of those are subjects that are taught in the library, but not skills that AI can teach or build. We are absolutely leaning into maker pedagogy to make it so that those products that they generate from AI aren't, don't communicate what they need and what they know. So we want that maker pedagogy to show us how the kid understands this concept rather than the essay writing. So I think that I, I don't anticipate that school librarianship jobs will be affected. Thank you for that, Leo. Yeah, I agree that you know AI is not going to replace um, people yet, yet, um, but it will change the jobs. Therefore, upskilling, reskilling is really, really important. Um, and I am working on AI literacy. We at ACRA, we just set up a task force to focus on developing um, a set of AI competencies for library workers, so that once we have kind of defined those, we can develop training programs to help people upskill and reskill. So. Keep an eye out for that. Hopefully we can work with library science program as well to train the next generation. Yeah, really quick, I'll also add that I also think that it's going to change um, jobs. And so prompt engineering is going to be one of those. I know some of the recent job titles I've seen are director of research for policy and ethics in AI. There was one for architect, AI ethical practice. So I think it's changing the jobs. I think um, it won't replace uh, people, but it will replace people who don't know how to use it. Um, so that's the thing that I think people need to think about. Well, that was a speed question that all of you um, answered so thoughtfully and concisely. So I know we could have unpacked that into more conversations, but certainly this was a great way to close out the session. So I want to thank all three of you for sharing your thoughts, Dr. Bryony McNeil, Dr. Leo Eslo, and Ida May Craddock for being here and sharing your concerns, also your questions and, and ideas. And so um, we're gonna transition to the sessions coming up and be sure to join us in our closing keynote conversation with Dr. Maggie Malo from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill School of Information and Library Science. And so again, um, thank you to our presenters and we look forward to attending the sessions uh, in the next uh, hour. So um, you can take a, a break before the, the hour starts. So thank you all again. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, everybody. Great job. Lots more fun to come. Yeah, I'm just saying on to all the emojis stop, right? They're just like... <laughs>